Okay. Okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, thank you all for joining us today for the Innovators in Cognitive Neuroscience speaker series. Uh, before we begin, let us please acknowledge the indigenous lands from which we're calling in today. The land I'm calling in from and the surrounding area is marked in name by the people from whom this land was taken, the Massachusetts people. Please refer to the link in the chat um, to take a moment to reflect on where you're joining us from today. Um, through the recognition of past harms, we can resolve to create more equitable and humane futures. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Giannini and I'm a graduate student at Harvard University. On behalf of all the students and postdocs on the organizing committee, um, I'm happy to welcome you to the 12th talk in the Innovators in Cognitive Neuroscience speaker series. Collectively, we represent a consortium of schools committed to highlighting innovative advances in cognitive neuroscience. Columbia, um, Dartmouth, Gallaudet, Harvard, MIT, UPenn, Princeton, and Yale. We acknowledge that these schools are elite institutes of higher learning, and in order to de-silo the generation of knowledge within the ivory tower, we plan to make these talks publicly available on the website with the consent of the speakers, which brings me to today's talk. Um, today we'll be hearing from Dr. Dwight Kravitz, who's an Associate Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at George Washington University. Dwight completed his Bachelor's of Science in Cognitive Science and his PhD in Psychology at Carnegie Mellon, where he worked with Marlene Berman. After his time at Carnegie Mellon, um, Dwight completed a postdoc and research fellowship at the National Institute of Mental Health, where he worked with um, Chris Baker. He studied a wide variety of topics concerning high-level vision, including the brain's representations of scenes, bodies, and objects, and the neural mechanisms of visual imagery and working memory. While at the NIH, he also wrote updated frameworks on the ventral and dorsal visual streams with the scientists who originally introduced the frameworks um, 30 years prior, Mortimer Mishkin and Leslie Ungerleiter. Now the head of the Laboratory of Cognitive Neuroscience at George Washington University, Dwight's research continues to focus on the relationship between neuroanatomy, experience, and neural representations. Today, he will be presenting his work titled Predicting Functional Organization and Its Impact on Behavior. Please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Dwight Kravitz. Uh, thanks, um, everybody, for coming. I'd like to thank the organizers as well for putting together um, a great talk series, uh, and, and I know it was a Herculean effort, and for coordinating a series of really good meetings across um, faculty from all these different un universities. Um, what I want to talk about today, actually, is uh, in essence, an overview of my career, much the same form that uh, was just was just given. Um, my interest most broadly is in the relationship, right, of behavior to the neural sub substrate, right? It is cognitive neuro neuroscience. Um, and what this picture is meant to show is exactly how difficult this actually turns out to be. Um, I think what we have coming from the sort of cognitive science side is a bunch of elegant theories and behavioral paradigms that are describing behavior and behavioral mechanism. And from the neuroscience side, a bunch of, again, really elegant experimentation describing the basic ways in which neurons function and are organized. Um, but actually getting these two things to meet requires us to jump a chasm, right? And that chasm is systems neuro. Um, and, and, you know, as came up in my conversations today, right, that is a very difficult chasm to jump. We lack the necessary data. I'm going to show you evidence today that not only is it a raging river, but that the form of that river alters itself to optimize itself to your, to your paradigm. Um, in essence, that it's trying to outsmart you um, and that it quite often does succeed. Uh, if we're going to make progress on this, we need to approach things from a slightly different angle. And that's what I want to talk, talk, talk to you about today. So this is going to be sort of a hybrid of a bunch of um, empirical results spread out across a bunch of different subdomains within the field. It's also occasionally going to be um, a call for uh, a new way of approaching these sorts of uh, questions. So let's, let's get, in, get into it. Um, this is a, the typical way I think that, that a lot of cognitive neuroscience is sort of, is sort of approached. And it's um, the right way to start, actually. Right? We have a whole bunch of old cognitive cognitive models. Right? These are mechanistic um, accounts of how certain things function. This is a, a 
figure I pulled from one of Badley's recent reviews on working working memory. On the basis of these of these models, we then go to test their uh, these frame for, for frameworks. We then go to test specific paradigms, right, to see if our ideas hold, and then we observe the activation that we see in say the human the human brain. And what we want to be able to do is use that activation in order to do work, right, to say something interesting. Um, and I think the first approximation that a lot of people came to was sort of pointing at a thing and saying, well, I was studying working memory. Here's the response I got out of the brain. I'm going to point at these parts of the brain that I found to be active or to contain information. And I'm going to try to ascribe right, this function to that part of the brain. Um, in practice, of course, that turns out to be extraordinarily difficult. Uh, the way that the system actually functions um, is as an integrated circuit. And so, of course, all sorts of things are affecting other, other, other things. The bold metric itself is imperfect in a bunch of ways that we're not going to get into. And so the ability to make that conclusion is a little bit suspect, right? You're getting an imperfect view of a really complex system. Um, my approach has then been to take these observations and go and look and see what we know in detail right, about the uh, functional response that we observe in these sorts of areas. Um, and that oftentimes requires a jump into different literatures, looking at, you know, certainly down to the level of single unit recording, work in the rodent, and then even down to the level of sort of cellular molecular neuro, neuro, neuroscience. And in that, in those fields, we see a bunch of detail actually, right? Detail that we can use to hopefully make predictions, right, about what the behavior should be. In other words, it's treating the neuroscience data, right, not as a sort of final step in the analysis, but and not just as a dis not descriptively either, but to use it to make a novel prediction, right, a prediction that you would not have been able to make before, and show that there is a behavioral consequence, right, to your physiological observation, and then eventually, right, to use that information to refine our understanding of the behavior at a theoretical level. And so I hope I'll sort of pull this trick off a couple of times for you today. Um, I'm going to talk about three broad domains. One, the sort of broad functional organization, and this is going to relate to the neuroanatomy we've talked about before. Um, then I'm going to talk about the consequences of the co-localization of working memory and perception. And then finally, I'm going to talk a bit about um, how these more domain general uh, mechanisms that we know are in the biology, like synaptic plasticity, um, make particular predictions about the behavior that are testable. Um, with enough behavioral data. So that's where we'll get to the big, the big data stuff. Um, to begin to understand functional org org organization, I'm going to do this in an almost autobiographical sense. Um, within high-level vision, within vision itself, which is what I'm primarily interested in, the dominant framework is the sort of two-stream or two-pathway path model. Um, and that is based off of actually old lesion work in the monkey showing deficits in um, behavior that depends on pattern with lesions to the inferior temporal and behavior that depends on spatial relationships with lesions to the posterior parietal. Right, that leads to this bifurcation, right, of visual information proposed about, you know, where pathway versus a what. Um, and that idea has actually quite a lot of uh, utility. I think that it has launched an enormous amount of fruitful research, certainly if its citation counts are to be believed, and it leads to a simple characterization of the ventral visual pathway as a sequence of processing stages, right, where information flows from V1 to anterior temporal. And as it does, as it passes over each one of these synapses, you get an aggregation, right, of responses in the direction of more and more complexity. So early on, you have very rapid responses, very small receptive fields, they get bigger as you work your way through the hierarchy. And then if you, um, and you observe in a concomitant increase in the complexity of the stimuli that uh, these areas are, are selected for. If you take this basic idea and then implement it into computational models, um, you can achieve really quite powerful things, right? There are, uh, you know, both ethical and frankly unethical applications of computer vision right now that borrow this basic idea of hierarchical processing in order to achieve all kinds of stuff. Um, and so in that sense, it is a relatively elegant story, right? We build complex representation from simpler ones. Um, but immediately it runs into an observation from the human fMRI literature that's a little mysterious, and that is category selectivity, right? We, we have what we observe really consistently in the human fMRI is different sub areas of the inferior temporal lobe that are sensitive to different categories. They respond to those categories more than they do to others. Um, and those things, moreover, are in stereotypical locations, and many of them have more or less um, directly related um, agnosias, right, which are uh, caused by, by damage in and around those, those areas as well. 
Um, and that on the surface of it is not something that you would predict from a sort of hierarchy. Why would you expect to observe clustered selectivity in stereotypical locations, right? Um, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. And that leads to alternative accounts, right? That, that don't view sort of intermediate high level vision as emerging, right? From the statistics of low level vision, but as a series of, you know, in extreme cases here in this paper from Dahan and Cowie, a series of sort of almost randomly um, evolved modules, right? that are designed to do particular tasks and are densely interconnected with the other modules that do that task, so a bunch of face areas together, but only loosely related to areas that, that aren't. The problem with that kind of a model is that we've in essence created a, a division, right, between the uh, physiological literature coming off of non-human non primates and the human, the human literature. Um, it also opens up an infinite quest because it means that now we can just keep looking for more and more areas, right? If we don't have some organizing principle for why areas are where they are and how they are formed, then this game will never, will never stop. We will find, and I think have actually already found in the literature, areas for cell phones and Pokemon and so on. Um, I'm going to make the argument that we can actually get these two things to agree if we consider the details of the neuro, the neuroanatomy. What it requires us to do, and the bit that I think is going to make it clear, is actually a result that comes from the fMRI, right? Here's the VWFA, which is an area that is um, it has all of the same characteristics as the other category selective regions. It's in a stereotypical location, it has an associated disorder, um, but there's no way that this is the result of evolutionary pressure, at least not directly, right? You can't actually have evolved something to deal with orthography when literacy in the United States, at least charitably, is you know perhaps 150 years old. Um, and so there's gotta be some alternative way, right, for these regions to come about and have all of these aspects that doesn't require us to claim that evolution is selected, right, for those stimuli directly. Um, and it was in under this sort of a, a motivation that uh, we proceeded to look in greater detail at exactly what the neuroanatomy of these two pathways are. And throughout the talk, I'm going to show occasionally pictures of, of collab collaborators. You can see my collaborators for the neuroanatomy on the bottom. Um, I will say as a blanket statement that I am absolutely in debt to all of them. The work would not be possible without them. Um, later on, I am even reusing certainly figures and slides because I think they are wonderful and I could not have done a, be a better job. Um, when we undertook this, uh, and here I will call out Salim Kadharbacha on the far left for his encyclopedic knowledge of the macaque neuroanatomy, right? When we aggregated together the 30 or 40 years of tracer work that had been done since uh, the original proposition of these pathways, you see actually there's a huge amount of detail. And I don't want you to try to take all that detail on board uh, because it's a little bit overwhelming. But what I do want you to get is that there's a lot of internal structure and in the connections. It's not just a series of sort of one arrow going down the entire length of the uh, temporal lobe. And there's also a complex set of relationships to the output structures, right? Where the anterior temporal lobe is connected, right, to really five different, different systems. Here I'm showing you the, the sort of three cortic cortical ones. And amidst all the complexity of that structure, uh, my argument is that there is a way of explaining why you observe category selectivity, right, these clusters in these prototypical locations, and it has to do with the availability of information, right? If you want to represent faces, right, you're going to want to have them in a part of the cortex that receives input from fovea, right? You're going to want to have them be relatively well connected to your explicit memory systems, right, so forth and so on. And so the large scale connections between brain areas are set genetically because you've got to squeeze all this into the human head. And by and large, those large fiber bundles at least are somewhat similar across, across people. That's going to be sufficient combined with experience that drives the need for these systems, right? To create them in these stereotypical lo locations. But we want to test that. Um, sorry, and so, I, sorry, to, sorry. sorry to interrupt, this is great. Could you just, could you go just uh, slightly slower for the ASL right. interpreters? Yes, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I am, I, am, I am flying a bit. Um, no, that's fine, this is great, thank you. Sure. Um, so within the domain, um, sorry, what we wanna do is test this idea, but we wanna test it in a way that's pretty data, data driven. Um, and this is the wonderful thing about scenes. Um, and this is why, you know, I oftentimes in my, in my research come, come, come back, back, back to them. Um, the first wonderful thing about them is that they are naturalistic, right? And they contain a huge amount of complexity. So when you look at this sort of a scene, you are effortlessly extracting information from it, but along a bunch of different dimensions, right? Scene category, the objects, the configuration of those objects, the overall geometry of the scene itself, right? All of those things could be potentially driving responses. 
And the other thing that's neat is that scenes are incredibly different from each other, right? Their heterogeneity allows us to test a wide variety of scenes that differ a lot in their internal structure. Um, and we're gonna lean into this in order to investigate scene representation. Okay, so what we wanna do is take advantage of the complexity and diversity of scenes. Um, and present them in such a way uh, that we get a sense of exactly what is being represented when we look at a scene selective area, right? So here's the parahippocampal place, place area, first described by uh, Russell, Russell Epstein. There's an enormous amount of follow-up work, um, but the interesting thing about it, right, is what is it representing about the scenes? It could be any of these aspects, right? And what we wanna do is make a prediction about what it's gonna be. Based on the neuroanatomy, the prediction is relatively clear. Right. First, looking at its inputs from early visual areas. In the macaque, the homologous area is TFO, TFTH, and the parahippocampal gyrus. That receives the majority of its input from the ventral portion of V4. Um, and moreover, it receives most of its input from the peripheral portions of that visual field map, meaning that it's getting a lot of relatively low level in, in information about the periphery. Okay, we can see echoes of that in the human data. Here's a classic paper from Rafi Malik looking at eccentricity biases. And you can see that the medial surface where the parahippocampal gyrus um, extends, extends from, right, is uh, responsive to the peripheral stimulus. Um, we can then look at the descending connectivity coming into the area here from the parieto-medial temporal pathway. This is a pathway extremely well described in rodent. Um, we described it here in macaque. You can see that TFO, TFTH is the recipient of this connectivity coming from the posterior parietal containing information about egocentric relationships to the outside environment. Um, and we can see hints of that in the human data as well. Here's a functional connectivity study from uh, Margulis from a number of years ago now. Um, and the uh, connection there in blue is demonstrated via functional connectivity and appears homologa. On the basis of those two factors, then, we're going to say that this is probably going to represent the spatial aspect of scenes, right? It gets information about the periphery. It's deeply connected to the parietal, to the hippocampus. The associated disorder is topographic disorientation of various forms, which is a navigation problem. To show that uh, to be true in human fMRI, we're going to conduct this really unbiased study um, where we're going to select 96 scenes from a broad range of different categories and spatial arrangements, and we're going to present them all individually during an orthogonal task and just look and see how the response of the PPA organizes these scenes um, by doing a multivariate analysis. Because each scene is an individual condition, we can then uh, directly visualize them in a multidimensional scaling plot. And so here the distance between the scenes is reflective of how distinct the representation is in the PPA. You can see the raw configuration on the right. And then on the left, you see the same configuration, but now colored by different underlying dimensions. And what I hope is apparent is the dimension that clearly creates an organization is this distinction between open versus closed, right? It's a spatial feature that isn't so much to do with indoor versus outdoor, but whether the boundaries of the scenes and the top of it are enclosed. So things like forest canopies fall, fall within it as well. Um, we want to now make a behavioral prediction, right? So here's the first version of this trick, right? If we think that we have this data-driven experiment, it's revealing that the PPA seems to care about this distinction between open versus closed, we should be able to predict behavioral judgments of open versus closed on the basis of the response of the PPA. So what we're gonna do is exactly that. We'll arrange a series of matches, um, chess matches in essence, right? Between two different scenes and a separate group of subjects. We present the two and simply ask which one of these is more open or more closed. And on the basis of a sequence of those, we can derive an ELO rating, um, which is a rating for how open or closed something is behaviorally. And then we can derive a homologous rating from the multivariate response in the fMRI and see if they're related, which of course they are. Right? And now what you're showing is that the, in, the level of the individual stimuli, the response of the PPA seems to be a good indicator right, for behaviorally um, these sorts of judgments. We want to show specificity, of course. On the right, you see early visual cortex. It doesn't particularly care about the distinction of open versus closed, nor does its um, uh, structure relate to the underlying behavior either. Okay, um, that's a good data-driven data demonstration that verifies the predictions of the neuroanatomy. There are other aspects of this organization that are also predictable, right? So uh, one other mystery is why do these areas come in pairs? There's one on the ventral surface, one on the lateral surface. The sort of, uh, there's not a firmly developed theory to a degree. People are suggesting that perhaps the lateral surface is lower level than the ventral surface and it's feeding information in. So what you're looking at are two stages of a object-specific hierarchy. 
Um, but here's some really great work by Ed Silson and Annie Chan from Chris Baker's lab. They are both now faculty in Britain. Um, shows that actually there's a simpler explanation. So here, if you look at the neuroanatomy and you look at the lateral surface, you see it derives a majority of its input from the dorsal portions of the visual field maps that are therefore the lower visual field. The ventral surface gets from the uh, ventral portions of those maps, therefore the upper visual field. So my argument will simply be the reason you have these pairs is because one of them deals with the lower visual field and one deals with the upper. You can do the population receptive field mapping here in any area you want to really, but here it is for PPA and the lateral equivalent TO, TOS or OPA. All right, and you can see the bias, right, in the uh, uh, population receptive field mapping with a lower bias on the lateral and an upper bias on the ventral. It's difficult to imagine how these can be organized hierarchically if they're representing different portions of the space. Instead, what is a seeming redundancy isn't, right? It's really about dealing with the same kind of information, but in different location. Okay, let's make another weird behavioral prediction, right? Um, this is going to be a really strange, strange one. What we observed was in the PPA, a good representation of open versus closed, but not in TOS. TOS didn't care about that distinction nearly as much. And neither one of them cared about the, dis the distinction between man-made versus natural. Um, that makes a weird prediction, which is that you should be better at making open versus closed judgments in the upper than in the lower visual field. And there should be no significant difference between man-made and natural. Um, so we'll test that directly. Here we'll just present the scenes very briefly, too brief to make an eye movement in one of the four quadrants of the visual uh, field and just ask them to make the same open versus closed or man-made versus natural judgment. Um, what you're seeing here is the results of that where we've subtracted accuracy between the upper and lower visual field. Bars going up are, indicated, are indicative of an upper field bias. You're better right, at dealing with this distinction. You're more accurate in the upper than in the lower visual field for open versus closed, but there's no difference between man-made and natural. Right? So there's another set of strange predictions right, directly from the neuroanatomy that are borne out in both the physiology that then lead to this weird, be this weird beha behavioral prediction. Um, in there, though, that's all very well and good, but there's also a bit of a cautionary note in there, right, which says that a lot of the detail of the localization that we're actually observing um, is to a degree detail, right? It is a consequence of the neuroanatomy and maybe not as directly indicative of the sort of nature of processing, right, as we would like it to be. It means that our interpretation of the fMRI data at that first level of though this is what's active is really going to be a reflection most likely of a lot of these neuroanatomical constraints. Um, I think if we want to dive deeper, we want to make more use of the fMRI data than just sort of saying, okay, we can predict a lot of what's going on here from the, um, from the neuroanatomy and make some sort of odd one-off behavioral predictions. I think we want to take a deeper dive into some aspects of it. So to begin, I think um, localization is interesting. I think co-localization um, brings us into an entirely different regime. Once we say now, not that two stimuli evoke sort of similar populations, but two putatively distinct cognitive processes, right, are evoking responses in the same population, we can start to make interesting predictions about um, uh, the interaction between, between those. Um, and so this is going to be work that was done with Su Yun Lee, now faculty in Korea, and a former graduate student of mine, uh, Chun, Chun Wei Teng, um, whose slides I will be stealing liberally. So let's consider um, uh, the classic model of working, of working memory, right? Classic model is that you have a central executive, right? Something that is distinct and engaged in a control, right? Of several specialized buffers that hold particular kinds of information. And these buffers are thought to be distinct, right? From the underlying long-term memory representations that they are pulling in, in, in information from. Um, that leads to uh, a set of neural models um, which involve shifting information, right, between different systems. So let's take a simple case. We'll leave aside manipulation for a moment and just talk about maintaining something in memory. So I present a stimulus. That stimulus um, is shown and then taken away, and you have a task that requires people to hold that in mind. The neural model is that that information, based on the cognitive model, is that that information is then transferred, right, into uh, some sort of a frontoparietal circuit that's more capable of maintaining state than the perceptual system, and that's where you're going to do your maintenance and your manipulation. 
There is, however, um, a large set of results, and I'll show you one of one of them now, showing that when you look at the information, right, where the information is to be found during those delays, when you're holding things in mind, you actually find that information within perceptual areas, depending on exactly the information that you're maintaining. So here's um, a study that we did several years ago now. Um, it borrows heavily from sort of Frank, Frank Tong's working memory studies, um, except the design is gonna use real world objects. So you're shown two objects and then you're presented a cue that tells you which one of them you have to hold during the delay. And then in different runs, you're either doing a visual or non-visual task, right? In the visual task, you're going to say whether or not a little sliver of object matches the thing you're holding in mind. So the task requires visual detail. And in the other task, you're just going to say whether or not the category matches, right? So you don't need to maintain visual, visual detail there. Otherwise, this entire sequence is exactly the same between the two, the two sets of runs. The only thing we're varying is the task demand. And despite that simple variation, we see information in different parts of the brain, right? So here, when you're holding visual information in mind in posterior perceptual areas, we get successful decoding during the delay, um, but not when you're holding non-visual information. And then the crossover interaction with the opposite being true for the prefrontal cortex, right? That indicates that different areas can both maintain state, right? And that depending on the nature of the information you're maintaining, you recruit, right? Sensory motor recruitment, you recruit the areas that are generally processing that information to begin with, okay? Um, that's going to have an interesting implication, right? Because now what we're saying is that the maintenance of information, at least when it requires visual detail, is to at least to some degree activating an overlapping population, right, of cells with um, the cells that are responsible for processing incoming perceptual information. And that very much directly predicts a set of interactions between them, right? One, we expect a bidirectional Inter interference between them, right? What you are holding in mind should slightly alter what you see, and what you see should slightly alter what you're holding in mind. Um, two, we know a lot about these areas of the brain. We know, for example, what their tuning is like, and that helps us to define adjacency, similarity between stimuli, and we expect those interference effects to follow, right, that similarity metric of the known, the known tuning of these um, areas. And then we're also going to expect um, inter interference to persist over, over delays. Um, to test this, we're going to run a couple of sort of deceptively simple experiments. I will also say this is all crowdsourced data. And so it's a really fine-grained set of effects and measurements. And so it's also a bit of an advertisement, right, for doing um, even fine-grained psycho psychophysics via these crowd crowdsourced plat platforms. Um, in this first experiment, all we're going to do is present a memory queue, which is just a colored disk. Right, then the subject is gonna do an RSVP task where um, they're going to be looking at the center of the screen and a sequence of letters is going to occur and they just have to press a button whenever the letter is white. Right, behind that um, letter, there's a gray circle, which is always the same. And behind that is a completely irrelevant color disk. Right, it has no bearing on the task at all. It means nothing. It's just completely distracting information. Right. What we're going to do is manipulate systematically the similarity between the cue that you're holding in memory and this distracting disk with the expectation that what we should observe in the memory report that follows is bias right, in the direction of this distracting disk, even though it's completely irrelevant, and that the amount of that bias is going to scale with the similarity right, of the distracting item to the um, memory cue. Right, that means the more similar it is, the more similar the population of cells that's being evoked, the stronger the bias. You're expecting to see a monotonic de decrease in this plot from left to right. That's exactly what you see. Okay, we can play this exact same game now, not for color, but for orientation, exact same experiment, and you get exactly the same basic result, right? The more similar a thing is, the more of an effect it has. This establishes one direction, right? It shows you that incoming perceptual information biases working memory report. Um, and I apologize for some of the weird figure figure things here. Um, what we want to do now is show the other the other direction, which is that visual working memory is going to affect what you are currently doing in perception. Um, as you might imagine, this is going to be a bit more involved. Uh, in order to do this, we have to run a discrimination task because we want to really be getting at perception as directly as we can. Um, and moreover, we're going to need to make a particular prediction, right, about what we're going to observe in it. So the basic paradigm is as follows. You're going to be presented with a color or oriented, uh, colored Gabor rather, and then you are instructed to either hold in mind its color or its orientation, 
Okay. Then we're going to present two more Gabors. Okay. After that one goes away and you've memorized it, um, we're going to present two more Gabors and you're going to discriminate them on the basis of, again, either color or orientation while you are still holding the original stimulus in mind. And following that, you then report, right, uh, what the uh, working memory stimulus was. And what we're going to expect to observe is a systematic set of biases introduced into this discrimination based on the relationship, right, of these stimuli to the thing you're holding in mind. Okay, so explaining that's going to take a second. Um, here, what we're going to have are uh, the color of the color spectrum. And let's imagine that these are the two colors that we are presenting for the discrimination. Okay, and your ability to discriminate them is going to be related to how far apart these two things are in this color in this color spectrum. Right, imagine in one condition, we'll call middle, the item that you're holding in mind lies directly between them, right? If it does, it's driving activation into this population and that population is going to introduce um, a bias, right? Into the perceptual response. Now the perceptual stimuli come in, they drive responses into that same area of the brain, but already there's some amount of response here that we're picking up with the fMRI, right? That lets us do the decoding. That means that, and based on our previous behavior, we expect the discrimination stimuli to move towards, right, the thing you're holding in mind proportional to how similar they are. And because they are equidistant from the thing you're holding in mind and it lies between them, they both move towards it. That means that the actual distance is going to be larger than the perceived distance, which should make your threshold worse, right, in this, in this condition. Now imagine the condition where you're holding a thing in mind, but it's off to one side. Right? Again, both of the discrimination stimuli will move towards it, but they move towards it to the degree they are similar to it. And so the stimulus which is closer will move further than the stimulus that's further away. Right? And that means that your perceived distance is actually gonna be larger, leading to a lower discrimination threshold for saying that those two stimuli are actually different from each other. Okay. Um, we're going to want to make sure, right, that um, we localize, that we quantify that rather really directly. So the second manipulation is, of course, going to be the gap in color or orientation space, right, between the discrimination stimuli, with the expectation that we can then recover this psychometric curve and from that derive these individual thresholds where we expect to see our differences. Um, we also want to have a control for passive carryover. Right? If in fact we have an effect between these two stimuli, we wanna make sure that it's due to active maintenance. Um, we do that by manipulating the match between the memory and discrimination task. Right? In essence, showing that our effects are specific to the conditions where you're matching. Right? In other words, where you're theoretically engaging the same population of neurons that creates the interference effects, but not present in the non-match conditions right, where you're not driving activation into these overlapping um, populations of cells actively. In the non-match condition, right, and the match condition are physically identical. They differ only in the task instructions, and therefore differences that you observe must be due to this sort of active, active maintenance. Um, long story short, all of those predictions are going to hold, and they're going to hold for both color and for orientation. Um, I'm showing you here now color uh, discrimination in the match condition, which is color memory, right? Here's the raw data for the middle condition. Here's the raw data for the side condition. Here are our psychometric curves, here are our derived thresholds, and you can see the expected difference. In the non-match condition where you're doing orientation memory but making the same color judgment, there's no such effect. We now run the same things now for orientation discrimination. In the match condition, we get a difference and attenuated in the non-match condition and non-significant confound. Right, we can plot that as in a simpler way as this crossover interaction, which is exactly what we hope to see. Right, and what it shows us is that your memory, right, uh, your, your maintained information is systematically affecting your perception, right? In other words, what you're holding in mind is changing what you see. Um, I think that's really interesting, right? It's a kind of prediction that flies in the face of a lot of the original sort of cognitive model, which suggests that these things are separate. And in fact, to a degree proposes that they're separate precisely to avoid this kind of inter interference. Um, but when we look at the neuroscience data, it suggests that it should be there. And when we run the right test, we see it. Um, we've actually just gotten a grant now to look at the causal relationship of this, where now we will um, uh, use TMS or TDCS to selectively interfere with particular parts of the brain where we think information is being held, and then show that, you know, this behavior is sensitive enough to pick, to pick up that effect as well. All right.
Um, and so the last thing that I want to talk about, and then I'll, I'm hoping to leave some some time for questions, right, is to talk about now um, more domain general mechanisms, right? So co-localization um, of two different processes is a quite a specific thing, right? It says that in this context for this task with this demand, we observe an overlap between these two these two processes. Um, and there are going to be, uh, you know, certainly opportunities to make those kinds of predictions. There are also there are opportunities to make predictions from these domain general mechanisms. Um, and this is going to be work that, you know, was really inspired by and made entirely possible by Steve, Steve Mitrov. Um, and so let's think about this for a second, right? When we talk about co-localization, we're talking about things like tuning, but tuning varies between areas, but there's a thing that doesn't. Right, and that is um, low level, almost cellular molecular level changes, which are gonna be occurring. And so the one we're gonna look at specifically here um, is going to be uh, uh, synaptic changes, right? So if we drive energy through a circuit, right? We are going to have some long-term effect, a hysteresis effect on that circuit, right? At a minimum, we're gonna have slow calcium kinetics, right? So calcium is gonna rush into the synapse and it's gonna sit there depolarizing it for an extended period, period of time. Then you have metabotrophic receptor activity and beyond that you have, you know, protein synthesis if all goes, goes well and then synapses are gonna, are gonna get stronger. But that should happen pretty obligatorily, right? Regardless of what the form of the information is, regardless of what the task is, right? If I'm driving information into the circuit, I should get a reinforcement. Um, but it's going to be relatively difficult to detect. Um, and into this gap, and it does actually, in fact, create a debate, right? Within the cognitive science psychology literature, there's a bit of an active debate about whether or not you see things like learning effects for irrelevant stimuli, right? Um, and a lot of that, I'm going to make the argument, comes down to power. So um, to tell you very briefly the story of airport scanner. So Steve, Steve Mitroff um, reached out to the makers of this game um, because he discovered it sort of at uh, random and discovered that they had, um, unbeknownst to themselves, um, designed a huge psychology experiment. So they had built a game where you take on the role of an airport security screener and you repeatedly check bags for dangerous items. Um, and those bags are procedurally generated, right, at random. So there are a ton of different possible targets, a ton of different possible distractors, and they're all just presented, right? And the game is engaging enough that at this point, um, he reached out to them, got them to start saving data. And over the last seven years now, we've acquired three, actually these numbers are old, more like 4 billion trials of visual search across approximately 15 million separate um, devices or participants. Um, once we realized the, the potential of the data set, um, Steve then got them to implement a thing called R&D Lab, which you see here at the bottom, that contains some more sort of controlled psycho psychophysics. Um, in particular, it has an object sorting task, which is um, very simple. An item just appears in the center of the screen and you have to decide whether it's dangerous or not. Um, what that means is we now have a large amount of data on two different tasks um, in which we can investigate learning with a really incredible level of detail, right? We actually have 15 million people, right? Who have separately gone through the first in trials of this game. And each one of them has experienced, right? Something different, but across the 15 million of them we have an incredibly good sample of all the different possible forms of experience that someone could have in the early part of the, uh, the game. Ooh, so what we're gonna do is try to directly quantify the impact of experience, right, on current behavior. And we're gonna start here in the object sorting task. So here again, object appears and you just say whether it's, da whether it's prohibited, dangerous or not. And what I'm plotting for you here, forgive some of the weirdness of the axes, um, is going to be your average accuracy, right, at a prohibited item, given the trial history that came before it. And so each, the, the number of trials is on the x-axis and then each one of the different lines is a different number of the prior trials that had a prohibited item, right? So what you observe is the greater the proportion, right, of prohibited items that you've seen before, the better your performance is on a current prohibited item, right? And you can see that by sort of scanning between these different color, colored bars. And then the more evidence you have, right, the more trials you've seen, the better your performance is. And you can get a sense of that by just scanning across the top, okay? 
that tells us, right, that there's what would be a pretty standard relationship, right, between the amount of evidence and the nature of that evidence that we can directly represent really simply using binomial Z, chi-squareds, Bayesian statistics, we've run them all. I'm going to show you the binomial Z because numerically it's the best, right, and what we're going to do is now translate each one of these points, right, directly into the binomial Z space. Okay, so we'll take the number of trials and the proportion of prior prohibited, translate that, that into a z-score, do that repeatedly, and do it now for all of the data, and it fits the data almost perfectly, right? What we see here for this really simple task, right, where your response and the nature of the stimulus and all sorts of things are perfectly correlated. We see an enormous effect, right? A 10% difference in accuracy, depending on the different experience that you've had leading into it, and an enormously tight relationship, right? In average performance, at least, um, to this really simple metric of statistical evidence. Um, what we want to do now is move into the visual search data where we have more flexibility. Here we can begin to deconfound task relevant from more task irrelevant factors and see whether or not learning is still occurring, occurring there. Okay, um, again, you know, to make a long story short, leave time for questions. Essentially, that is going to work. Here, I'm going to show you now the effect for trial type. So this is your ability to do, um, to detect a target based on the evidence for target present trials in general, irrelevant of what the particular stimuli are. Here, we observe the same, re the same relationship in hit rate. Here's the same relationship, uh, obviously, opposite in direction for reaction time. Okay, so we generalize this now between two different tasks. Um, we did this in a million people. We have since independently replicated it four or five different times in other sets of a million people as well. It always comes out the same. Now we can go ahead and look at completely task irrelevant information, right? And here the definition of task irrelevance is sort of drawn from the literature. What I really mean is distractors, right? Things which are orthogonal to um, whether or not the target is there. So for example, here we have the, head, the headphone distractor. It's never a target, um, but it can appear in both target present and absent bags, and it can also fail to appear on both target, absent, and present bag. So nothing about that stimulus is diagnostic as to the task that you're, that you're dealing with. All you have to do is be able to reject it, right? You want to be able to reject it as a distractor. And as it turns out, your speed of doing that, right, is entire, is not entirely, but largely based on your experience with that distractor. So here we calculate the z-score and now evidence for headphones, right, as a stimulus. And we look at your hit rate, right, for target present trials when the headphones are there, and your hit time, right, for that as well. And we see the same basic relationship again, a very tight relationship to that binomial Z. And this is exactly what we expect from a sort of simple local synaptic re reinforcement rule. I've driven energy through this, that circuit becomes primed. As a result, behavior becomes slightly more efficient, right, at dealing with other, other scenarios that are similar. What's interesting, right, is that with this volume of data, we can play this game for any dimension you feel like playing it for, right? We can play it for things that seem almost completely irrelevant, for, you know, broad things like color, for highly specific things, right, like these head headphones, and we observe the same basic relationship, right? That's fundamentally consistent with a sort of distributed processing view and with the very basic prediction of this domain general synaptic change, right, in response to, to experience. Um, I think also that when, and I'll just say a last word and then leave time for uh, questions. I think also that when we begin to combine these results together, um, they suggest that the, the thing that we're dealing with, right, the human cognitive system is a great deal more complex than we originally gave it credit for, right? It seems extremely sensitive to the context in which things are presented, right? So it's picking up on the statistics of visual experience, even for things that are, you know, largely background distracting information. Um, it's also making use, right, of the same circuits to do perception and some of these higher level cognitive processes. And it's pretty reasonable to expect that that also has a continuous consequence, right? Every time, in other words, that working memory or attention or decision making directly interacts with a perceptual circuit, right, in order to um, extract an answer to a particular task, it's going to change the synapses there as well. And now we have the emergence of the joint constraint, right, the statistics of experience, along with the co-localization of task demand and cognitive process, um, is how we get to functional organization, right? The reason why you have an FFA is because you have an area of the brain that has access to the information to derive faces and deal with them. 
then you see a bunch of faces and you see an increasing number of them and pay attention to them more because they provide you useful information for these tasks. But the way that that's accomplished is through an interaction that occurs within the perceptual circuitry, effectively shaping it, right, to become adaptive for your particular functions. This is also maybe the reason why we see some structure, right, even in cases of people who are, for example, congenitally blind, where there is some gross alignment, right, still in their functional organization, it could reflect these top-down constraints as well. And so I think that there is a lot of exciting work to be done here, right? To be able to understand all of these, all of these relationships and it's starting to generate a novel set of predictions that I think make for really interesting neuroscience and really interesting behavior. The bit that I think is a, is a challenge, right? Is this incredible sensitivity, right? The context specificity of both behavior and very likely the underlying neural mechanisms as well. Right, it means that people are gonna be different from each other. People will be different from themselves over time. Um, and different stimuli are going to evoke different responses, right, from each other, but also from themselves across different tasks. And so we're going to need to collect massive amounts of data across wide varieties of different kinds of people, different kinds of stimuli, different kinds of tasks. And we're gonna to have to do that in a way that is high throughput and that automatically aligns the data right, so that we can discover the relationships between these tasks, right, um, and we're not going to be able to just do it based on big, big data. I want to say that as well. The, the large data set offers you infinite power, and you can discover incredibly fine-grained things with the fidelity that that affords, but you will always have a need for controlled experimentation, right? There are going to be definitely specific things to that context that need to be sussed out. Um, but sussing that out requires us to collect the data directly, and it requires a system that allows us to do that. And this is part of the reason why I am so excited about crowd crowdsourcing, because I think it it moves us in the direction, and and you know my lab is working on developing tools to do this, for making that process more efficient, for reducing the cost and the schedule, and allowing us to probe the space of behavior much more fully. Um, and I think it's going to continue to reveal interesting things, and I think it's going to help us to guide our neuroscience as well. Um, and so with that, that's my whirlwind tour of my career. Thank you for the attention, and I will take any questions that you might you might have. I'm sorry to interpreters if I was fly, flying through also. Great. Thank you so much, Dwight. Um, so yeah, so just a reminder, um, if you have any questions, uh, you can post those in the Q&A, or if you see questions in there that you like, um, then upvote those, and we'll go in order of that priority. Um, uh, and also, there's going to be a... Um, uh, Q&A after this talk for um, trainees and graduate students and postdocs. Um, so we're going to put a link um, to that Q&A in the chat right now, um, if you'd like to join us. So the first question um, is coming from Marlene Berman. Mm -hmm. And um, she says, perception and visual working memory, the fact that there are two separate labels suggests that these are two separate processes. Can we just consider this to be a single process with initial representation, and then perhaps hysteresis, i.e. the visual working memory component. So of course, Marlene, and, and thank you for the, for, for the question as well. And it's good, it's good to you know, see you. The, um, the answer to the question is in part, yes, right? I think that when you're talking about the maintenance, particularly of visual detail, um, probably we can begin to think of these two processes as being very related right, um, at least within that, that circuit. And we can study exactly how related they are in that we have a good understanding of that circuit. And what we'll find, right, is that they are overlapping, but that there are going to be slight differences in exactly the population. You know, I'm not sure I buy the laminar story there. Um, and, you know, probably in the timing as well. Where there's still gonna be a difference is I think in the initiation, right? My guess is that um, the natural state of the perceptual cortex is sort of rapid decay, right? And that is, adaptive, right, in that if you're moving around, you kind of don't want, you know, to hallucinate the room that you were just in. Um, and so there's got to be some sort of a, a control signal, right, that at the very least sets up some sort of a dynamic, right, that causes it to maintain state. And that's very likely to be some sort of a recurrent relationship with prefrontal if for no other reason than, you know, the task demand in the case of the human subjects is being verbally interpreted. Um, and so, you know, part of the, the grant that we have to look at the causal mechanisms is to start to understand that control signal. But, you know, the brief answer to your question is, I think they are much more related. And I think that one of the 
promising bits of this approach, right, is that eventually, rather than just sort of having these two broad category labels, we will specify, right, what the relationship is, right, what exactly we mean when we say working memory maintenance versus perception in a way that isn't just the, cate the, cate the, ca the category label. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it there because I think we have other, other questions as well. Great. Yeah, so I'm going to be doing some weird combo of priority and order. So the next question is um, coming from uh, Vlad Eisenberg. Um, okay. So his question is about visual imagery. Um, and how do you think about visual imagery? To what, to what degree might visual imagery play a role in your um, working memory experiments and your second section of your talk? Um, mm -hmm. That is, rather than working memory, interacting with perception directly, one strategy to remember the stimulus maybe to visualize it which in turn interferes with the percept. So how, I guess, yeah, in general, how are you thinking about oh, I, I think that, working memory or are these the same process or, uh, yeah. So I think um, the sort of the point of, and you know, maybe I can go back to it. Um, I think that you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on sort, of, on sort of the head and it goes back to Marlene's question, right? And I, I think Dan, you, you just alluded to it, right? To what degree do we have to think about these things as being um, different? Right, and to my mind, this is where, oh, and I apologize for going through, this result is sort of interesting, right? So here's a working memory task. The task, right, is you have to hold this thing in mind and then you're gonna do something with it afterwards. But when we require the visual detail, we see the decoding in these perceptual areas. And when we don't require the visual detail, we don't, right? So I think Vlad, you know, I, I think we are largely in agreement, right? I think that when we think about visual imagery and the maintenance of visual detail, I think the difference between those two things might be largely paradigmatic, right? That's largely about the label that, that we tend, tend to use. I think that there are going to be different tasks, right? That evoke different subcomponents of this system. But I think that absolutely the reason why you're getting the interaction is because you are requiring visual detail. And in doing so, you're driving activation into the perceptual circuits, and that's what creates the um, interaction between them, right? Here, when you require, and this is the, the non-match condition, right? So when you require visual detail, but it's different visual detail, right? You don't drive activation into the same population and you don't get the interference effects either. So, you know, my brief answer to your question is that visual imagery and the maintenance of visually detailed information are likely to be highly related, right? Why would you reinvent the wheel, right? In order to accomplish two tasks that increasingly look to be pretty much the same, at least in this particular element. Okay. Great. Uh, so the next question comes from Nicholas uh, Blouch. Mm -hmm. Says, "Great talk, super interesting. I would agree. I would argue that stimulus differences between domains, uh, combined with wiring constraints within IT, is an additional principle driving organization within IT, oh, which is then anchored by long-range connectivity. You discussed. Do you agree? Absolutely. So, uh, take the example of faces, right? So faces." Um, are the example par excellence of this, right? There are differences between faces and scenes and faces and objects, and there are huge differences um, in the stimulus domain itself, right? The statistics of it as a stimulus. There are huge differences in the tasks that you're doing, right? So if you're processing a face, let's assume you're trying to extract identity, visual information about emotional content, reactions to things, right? Like I'm looking to make sure I'm not doing things too, too quickly for the interpreter, all that stuff. All of that is, um, really fine-grained detail, right? So you're making different kinds of judgments than you are about scenes as well. I think all of that, right, is going to define where you get um, uh, the stimulus response, right? So scenes are wide field by definition. It's not therefore surprising that the area that represents them most strongly tend to receive strong input from the periphery, right? Whereas faces you tend to, to foveate and that tends to end up in, um, in the extensions of those, of, the, of those areas. So absolutely, it's going to be, the functional organization is going to emerge from a combination of these stimulus factors, these task factors, and then the information availability, right, which is defined by the neuroanatomy that interacts with both of those as well. Absolutely. So the next question is coming from uh, Max Penzik. Uh, he says, and apologies to anybody whose name I don't get quite right. He says, very interesting, devil's advocate question. Mm -hmm. How do you make sense of functional localization in light of increasing evidence from NHP electrophysiology that cognitive variables are highly distributed across cortical regions? 
if certain kinds of information are only preferentially stronger in one region over another, in what sense is it helpful to speak of functional regions at all? Yeah, so this is, Max, and that's a great, a great question, right? We begin to erode under this formulation and absolutely relative to the electrophysiology. And I think, um, you know, even some of that electrophysiology now in um, epileptic patients, right, that suggests a greater distribution. Um, I think that that is, it speaks to also the argument that I'm making, right? Which is that these areas are not so much areas, right? As they are clusters of cells, right? That have a joint function as defined by the particular contrast that you're running, right? So if your interest is broadly a contrast between say faces and objects and you get FFA, right? That's interesting. And the fact that it's in the same location across people is a thing that we have to deal with. Right, that's not totally artifactual to the averaging or the, the grossness of fMRI as a as a metric. Right, we need to explain that. But at the finer level of detail, we absolutely should never say, "Oh, this is where face processing is, and only here." Right, to a degree, that's directly interpreting the null. Right, because you're saying here's a significant difference in FFA and no significant difference elsewhere, but you're interpreting the no significant difference to mean uninvolved. And I think when we zoom in in detail on that, we come across cautionary tales for that interpretation all over the place. And so uh, the way that I think about this is if we define these regions um, in terms of these factors and we begin to pull at the threads, right? We'll get a better understanding of what it is that they are actually doing in detail beyond these gross distinctions. And I think some of that work has, all, has already begun. And I think we will eventually begin to grapple with the full complexity of all the circuits that are, that are involved as, as, as well. I think we have to acknowledge the limitation of any one version of collecting the data and look and try to buttress, right? To be able to say, well, here's the bit of this that really is interesting, that does hold up right, versus this other data that suggests maybe this is an artifact, right? Um, and there's no short shortcut at all, right? We're, we're, we will all be employed forever. We are gonna be here for decades and decades, absolutely trying trying to figure to figure all of this out. Cool, so I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. So the next one's from Margaret Henderson. She mm -hmm. says, thanks for the great talk. Uh, you mentioned the idea of domain general synaptic plasticity as a mechanism for implicit learning from task irrelevant stimuli. Mm -hmm. At the same time, top-down information about relevant features likely influences how and what we learn. How do you think these influences interact? I think um, they absolutely do. So let's take an extraordinarily simple, simple model, and you'll have to forgive, forgive me for it. But let's say that the task relevance of a feature scales the degree to which, right, you're driving energy through that circuit, right? So one, one way to say it is image, an image hits the, hits the retina and it will have a series of consequences, right? Obligatory consequences. But those consequences are very likely to be greater, right, if there's task relevance. And so what you might expect to see, and you know, we're beginning to test it now, is that when you look at the size of these, of these effects, and by that I mean you know, how, much, how much variability, how much of a performance difference there is along these sorts of gradients, that that will go along with right, the task relevance. And so Marlene asked a bit of a, a, bit of a question earlier, which is, you know, yes, we get the effect for headphones, but it seems relatively small. I think that the relative size of that effect right, is, going to be based on task relevance to at least a degree, right? If you're pushing more energy through the circuit, you should get larger effects and larger op op optimization. So I don't want to make the claim, you know, oh, task relevance is irrelevant when you're thinking about learning. It absolutely is not. I think that it very likely up, up and down regulates this learning in a very natural and simple way. Great. Yeah, I think so. It looks like we're at one o'clock now. Um, so that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you so much, Dwight. Uh, very interesting, great talk. And for again, for uh, trainees and grad students and postdocs who are interested, uh, there'll be a Q&A right now um, with the link in the chat and also um, included in the announcements that we sent out for the talk. That's uh, great. So I will see every, everyone there. And thanks everyone again for coming and for the uh, attention and the really great, great questions as well. Great. Thanks so much.